Habakkuk is the most unusual of the prophets we've studied thus far. And you're going to see why. If you're not familiar with, with the book, it's, uh, it's, it's totally out of the norm. You know, Jonah was different. But Jonah had the elements about it that we've come to think of, where God commissions a prophet to go and preach uh, to a people, a warning. Uh, Habakkuk is it's very different, and we'll see that in a moment. Let's pray, and then we will get started uh, with our study in Habakkuk. Dear Holy Father, we bow before you tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're so grateful for your goodness and your mercy to us, that we agree with the psalmist that your goodness and your mercy have followed us all the days of our life. Today has not been any different, and if you let us live to see tomorrow, we fully anticipate that we will taste and experience your goodness and your mercy shown to us. We're thankful we can gather and, and look into the scriptures and see, understand more of how, how they speak of Jesus, as he himself said. Pray that you'll teach us tonight from the book of Habakkuk. Help us to learn from him, uh, to apply the things we learn to our own lives, and understand better how our Lord Jesus Christ is taught in this book. We pray that you'll meet with the folks, touch the folks' lives that we talked about this morning, draw near, strengthen the folks who've come tonight. I thank you for their commitment, their desire to to gaze into your word and increasingly see the Lord Jesus Christ. May you bless their lives for these efforts. We give all this to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, let's do something a little different. We're going to start with the, uh, with the video from the project on Habakkuk, and then we will, we will take a look at the scripture, sort of to the, the key verses, and then we'll go through our study of Habakkuk. At Habakkuk. He lived during the final decades of Israel's southern kingdom, and it was a time of injustice and idolatry. He saw the rising threat of Babylon on the horizon, and that was not good news for anybody. But unlike the other prophets, Habakkuk does not accuse Israel. He doesn't even speak on God's behalf to the people. Rather, all of his words are addressed personally to God. And the book tells about Habakkuk's personal struggle, his journey of trying to believe that God is good when there is so much evil and tragedy in the world. And so Habakkuk's words are actually poems of lament, and they're very similar to the laments that you find in the book of Psalms. The poet lodges a complaint and then draws God's attention to suffering or injustice in the world, demanding that God do something. And knowing about this lament form, it's actually the key to understanding the design and message of this short book. Chapters 1 and 2 are framed as a back-and-forth argument between Habakkuk and God. And the prophet lodges two complaints to which God offers two responses. His first complaint is that life in Israel has become horrible. The Torah is neglected, resulting in violence and injustice, and it's all being tolerated by Israel's corrupt leaders. And Habakkuk, he's crying out, asking God to do something, but nothing seems to change. But then all of a sudden, God responds. He says that he's very aware of the corruption of his own people, Israel, and that he's summoning the armies of Babylon to bring down his justice on Israel. And very similar to the message of Micah or Isaiah, God says he will use this terrifying empire to devour Israel because of their injustice and evil. But Habakkuk has a problem with this answer, and so he offers his second complaint. He says Babylon is even worse than Israel. They're more corrupt, they're more violent, they've deified their own military power, they treat humans like animals, gathering them up like fish in a net, he says. They devour nations and people groups in order to build their own empire. And so Habakkuk says, how can you, a holy, good God, use such corrupt nations as your instruments in history? He demands an explanation. In fact, he depicts himself as a watchman on the city walls waiting for God's response, which eventually comes. God tells Habakkuk to get out some tablets and chisel and write down what he sees and hears. It's a vision about an appointed time in the future that even though it may seem slow in coming, it will eventually come. In fact, God says that the righteous person will live by their faith in this hope and vision. 
So what is this divine promise that Habakkuk is supposed to write down? It's that God will bring Babylon down. God says that the violence and oppression of the nations creates this never-ending cycle of revenge and that God will use this cycle to bring about the rise and fall of nations. And the fact that God might for a time use a corrupt nation like Babylon does not mean that he endorses everything that they do. He holds all nations accountable to his justice. And so Babylon will fall along with any other nation that acts like them. God's promise is then elaborated by a series of five woes that describe the kinds of oppression and injustice that's perpetrated by nations like Babylon. The first two target unjust economic practices, like how wealthy people will charge ridiculous interest just to keep poor people in debt, and so they build their wealth through crooked means. The third woe is a critique of slave labor, treating humans like animals and threatening them with violence if they don't produce. The fourth woe targets the abuse of alcohol by irresponsible leaders. While people are suffering under their bad leadership, they're partying and wasting their money on sex and booze. And the last woe exposes the idolatry, the engine that drives such nations. They have made money and power and national security into their gods, offering these allegiance at all costs. And so people become slaves to their own national empire. Now the practices described here aren't unique to Babylon, but that's part of the point. Given the human condition, most nations eventually become Babylon. And so this is how God's answer to Habakkuk in this book becomes God's answer to all later generations, to anyone who lives in a world ruled by other Babylons. But it leaves the question hanging. Is God going to let this cycle, the rise and fall of Babylon-like empires go on forever? And that question is what chapter 3 is about. We're told that this is a prayer of Habakkuk, and it begins by Habakkuk pleading with God to act now in the present like he has in the past in bringing down corrupt nations. And what follows is a very ancient poem. It first describes a powerful, terrifying appearance of God. It's very similar to the opening poems of Micah and Nahum, and similar to the appearance of God at Mount Sinai in the book of Exodus. There's cloud and fire and earthquake. When the Creator shows up to confront human evil, everybody will be paying attention. Habakkuk then goes on to describe this future defeat of evil as a future exodus. So just like God came as a warrior and he split the sea in his battle against Pharaoh, Habakkuk says that God will once more bring his judgment down on the head of the evil house. So Pharaoh, like Babylon, has become here an archetype of violent human nations. But at the same time, we're told that when God confronts evil, he will save his people and his anointed one. It's a reference to the king from the line of David. And so in this poem, the Exodus story of the past has become an image of the future Exodus God will perform. He will once again defeat evil and bring down the pharaohs and the Babylons of this world. He'll bring justice to all people and rescue the oppressed and the innocent. And it's this hope that enables Habakkuk to conclude the book with hopeful praise. Even if the world's falling apart with food shortage or drought or war or whatever, he will choose trust and joy in the covenant promises of God. And so Habakkuk, by the end of this book, becomes a shining example of how the righteous live by faith. Habakkuk recognizes just how dark and chaotic the world and our lives can become, and he invites us into a journey of faith, of trusting that God loves this world more than we do, and that he will one day deal with its evil. And that's what the book of Habakkuk is all about. A good summary of that, of this book. It is short enough that we will, we will be able to do a lot of reading in it to get a little more comprehensive flavor of it. Uh, I want you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Habakkuk. It's, it's after Nahum. We looked at Nahum last night, and it's just before Zephaniah. And I just told you know where we are. Looking at Habakkuk tonight, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. We'll be through the Old Testament in just a few more uh, weeks of studying this. Habakkuk, and we're going to uh, take a look at a couple of verses uh, from here together. Uh, 
We'll have them on the screen for you, Habakkuk 2, 4, and Habakkuk 3, 17 to 19. Stand with me if you would. Found those in your Bible. If, uh, if not, we're going to have them on the screen. Follow along as I read these verses. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. Then chapter 3, verses 17. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herds in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on high places to the choir master with stringed instruments. We just read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. And what you see here is you see the declaration, the righteous shall live by his faith or the just shall live by his faith. And then the practical outworking of this, this, this language of hopefulness that comes from the prophet, that the circumstances that he faces, even if they become dire, will not change his attitude. They won't influence his attitude toward his trust in God. Thank you. Uh, please be seated. I just remind you quickly that the, the, the theme passage that is driving this study that got it all started to begin with is John 5, 39 and 40, where Jesus chided the religious leaders. You search the scriptures. And you think, well, that's good, right? They're spending time. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And again, that would be a good, good motive to look in the scriptures. And it is they that bear witness about me. So if you, if you study scriptures and you miss Jesus, you've wasted your time. It's they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. That was the condemnation of the Pharisees and the scribes and the lawyers of Jesus' day. Reading the scriptures, memorizing the scriptures, the Old Testament, and yet they would not acknowledge Jesus for whom the Lord had shown him to be. All right, Habakkuk is, just a real quick summary here, is a native uh, of Judah. He looks, as the video said, he sees violence uh, and injustice everywhere he turns. He cries out to God with some questions. Why are the wicked prospering in the midst of God's people? Sounds like a question the psalmist asks from time to time in the book of Psalms. Why are the wicked prospering in the midst of God's people? Why are the righteous beaten down? And why is God seemingly inactive and indifferent in a day of wickedness? And then God responds in a way that shocks Habakkuk. God assures his prophet he's doing something. The Chaldeans, a people even more corrupt than God's chosen nation, are about to descend as God is chastening. When Habakkuk reacts with shocks and dismay, God instructs him. And his messengers until at last the prophet is able to respond with a psalm of praise. And we just read part of that uh, psalm in chapter 3, verse 18 of Habakkuk. Position this for you. The place of this is in Judah, the southern kingdom. The time's about 607 BC. We'll investigate that a little more. But 607 BC, if you're, if you're thinking more clearly now about your Jewish history, what's about to happen in 586 BC? be the Babylonian captivity of the southern kingdom. So, so this is prophesied uh, just 20-something years before Babylon does indeed uh, overrun and overthrow Judah. The, the book lays out this way, the problems of Habakkuk in chapter 1, uh, verses chapter 1, 1 through chapter 2, 20, where uh, his faith, he's troubled to understand what God is doing. The first problem is laid forth in, in chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Let's read that together. The prophecy begins the oracle that Habakkuk, Habakkuk the prophet saw. He identifies himself as Habakkuk the prophet. This, is a, this designation is very much like, like Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He's been commissioned by God and, and he designates himself. Yet the thing that's unusual, as you heard in the video, is he does not preach to the people. He doesn't go to Judah and preach to them about the, about the injustice uh, and, and all the, the evil that abounds. 
He's a prophet who strictly takes up his concerns with God. This whole book is really prayers uh, in the form of psalms and things like that of Habakkuk to God. So let's look at chapter 1, verse 2. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear. Or cry to you violence, and you will not save. Why do you make me see iniquity? Why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. I mean, this is a, this is a heart cry of a man of God who sees his generation, and it, it, makes, him, it makes him ill. Well, God responds in chapter 1, verses 5 to 11. Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded. For I'm, going to, I'm doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told. For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that is the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence. All their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. This is, this is not the answer Habakkuk anticipated. God says, watch. I'm doing something. And you're going to have to watch it and see it because if I told you what I was doing, you wouldn't believe it. He raises up Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar to, to bring his punishment upon his people for, for going astray and going their own way. And then this prompts Habakkuk to, to respond with another concern. Listen to chapter 1, verse 12, to chapter 2, verse 1. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent? When the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he you may you make mankind like the fish of the sea like crawling things that have no ruler you he brings all of them up with a hook he drags them out with his net he gathers them in his dragnet so he rejoices and is glad therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet for by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaints as Lord. These people, they're going to, if if you turn them loose, they will destroy us. These people are wicked. They're totally against everything that you stand for. How can you let this happen? That's his, that's his concern. Well, look at God's second reply in chapter 2, verses 2 and following. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold... His soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. He says, basically, I know. I know what the people I'm using. I know what they're like. But I want you to hear the message. Hear the message. The message of hope. And we're going to see later on in the study that this this message, the just shall live by faith. Uh, This was cited three times at least in the New Testament. It was the flashpoint of the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century that countered all of the false religion that was welling up in the day. And God says, here's your answer. Here's your answer. The righteous will live by his faith. You're going to have to trust me on this, Habakkuk. And then he goes on. 
Moreover, wine is a traitor, an arrogant man who is never at rest. His greed is as wide as a shield. Like death, he never, never has enough. He gathers for himself all nations, collects as, as his own all peoples. Shall not all these take up their taunt against him with scoffing and riddles for him and say, Woe to him who heaps up what is not his own. For how long? And loads himself with pledges. Will not your debtors suddenly arise and those awake who will make you tremble? Then you will be spoiled for them because you have plundered many nations. All the remnant of the peoples shall plunder you. For the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. Woe to him who gets evil gain for his house, to set his nest on high, to be safe from the reach of harm. You have devised shame for your house by cutting off many peoples. You forfeited your life, for the stone will cry out from the wall, and the beam from the woodwork respond. Woe to him who builds a town with blood and founds a city on iniquity. Behold, it is, is it not from the Lord of hosts that peoples labor merely for fire, and nations weary themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him who makes his neighbors drink. You pour out your wrath and make them drunk in order to gaze at their nakedness. You will have your fill of shame instead of glory. Drink yourself and show your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around you and utter shame will come upon your glory. The violence done to Lebanon will overwhelm you as will the destruction of the beasts that terrified them, for the blood of man and violence to the earth, to cities and all who dwell in them. What profit is an idol when its maker has shaped it? A metal image, a teacher of lies, for its maker trusts in his own creation when he makes speechless idols. Woe to him who says to a wooden thing, Awake, to a silent stone, arise. Can this teach? Behold, it is overlaid with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in it. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silence before him. Notice in this, in this response of the Lord two things. Look at verse 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What a great hopeful uh, anticipation of, the, of a better day coming as Habakkuk uh, grieves over what he presently sees. And then verse 20. But the Lord is in his holy temple. That all the earth keeps silence before him. Basically what he said here is, Habakkuk, I know your concerns. And my people have turned their back on me again. And I will use a wicked nation to punish my people. But the nation that punishes my people will be utterly destroyed for laying its hand against my people. And so this promise that God has not forgotten his people and that he will use even his, his wrath upon his people, even foreign nation punishing his people, he will use that to move them forward and to redeem them and to recover them. And so, so the reply of God comes. And then this prompts Habakkuk in chapter 3 to speak in, to in tones of praise. His complaint has gone out. God has answered him. Habakkuk praises God. This for who he is. Notice his first, his first complaint came because of what, he, what is God doing. I, I don't see God moving here. But he comes to do what all of us have got to do, brothers and sisters. We've got to come back, first of all, to who he is. See, too often we want to start out approach, approaching God based upon what we see or feel or imagine he is or is not doing. But if we will come back to praise him for who he is, for his unchanging character, we see more clearly with more hopeful eyes, redemptive eyes, what he is doing. So look at chapter 3 with me, and then we'll, we'll move on from this. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shigionoth. Just to, let's, you, you would recognize something like that in the Psalms. That's the way the Psalms are introduced, right? It's just, it's, it sounds very uh, psalmodic. Though the fig tree should not, oh, pardon me. O Lord, I have heard the report of you, and your work, O Lord, do I fear. In the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, remember mercy. Pick that up. Lord, I have, I've heard. I've heard of you, of what you've done in the past. And I tremble to know what you have done in the past. But I plead with you 
to revive your great work on behalf of your people. In the midst of the years, make it known. I, and this is one of my favorite passages in all of the Old Testament, in wrath. Remember mercy. I pray often for our, our culture, our nation. And I see how we sin so greatly against such goodness. And I often pray this, Lord, we know that as a nation we deserve, America deserves the full, unmitigated blast of the fury of the furnace of your wrath. We deserve it. We turn everything upside down. Official decrees, acts of judges, state houses, calling evil good and good evil. How proud we are as a nation. There's no blushing anymore. Women march in the streets celebrating their abortions. How we've gone down carrying on in just, in just unspeakable ways. Gay pride marches all over the country, vile, filthy, immoral. And those are celebrated, celebrated. Yet let someone like Billy Graham die, only one living president attended the funeral of Billy Graham. Only one. That's how far we've gone. And I pray this, Lord, we know you should show your wrath. And the fact that you don't every day is an incredible display of your mercy and your long suffering and your patience. But oh Lord, revive your work. What we read about in the 1700s when, when the Spirit moved and invaded this continent. In the 1800s, in the Second Great Awakening, when the Spirit again moved and came in power, sweeping transformation. In the 1900s, we didn't see it. We thought maybe at the, toward the end of the 1900s, what was called the Jesus Movement, we thought that might be a Third Great Awakening, but it was not. Now, Lord. In the 2000s, 18 years into it, we are not a people turning back to you. We celebrate every kind of perversion that your word speaks, leads people to destruction. Lord, in your wrath, which we know must come. Please remember mercy. Remember to show mercy. This is, a, this is a powerful, hard expression of the prophet. God came from Timon, that's verse 3, the Holy One from Mount Paran. His splendor covered the heavens. The earth was filled full of his praise. His brightness was like the light. Rays flashed from his hand. There he veiled his power. Before him went pestilence, and plague followed at his heel. He stood and measured the earth. He looked and shook the nations. Then the eternal mountains were scattered. The everlasting hills sank low. His were the everlasting ways. I saw the tents of Kishon in affliction. The curtains of the land of Midian did tremble. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord? Was your anger against the rivers? Or your indignation against the sea? When you rode on your horses, on your chariot of salvation, you stripped the sheet from your bow, calling for many arrows. You split the earth with rivers. The mountains saw you and writhed. The raging waters swept on. The deep gave forth its voice. It lifted its hands on high. The sun and moon stood still in their place at the light of your arrows as they sped. At the flash of your glittering spear, you marched through the earth in fury. You threshed the nations in anger. You went out for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. You crushed the head of the house of the wicked, laying him bare from thigh to neck. You pierced with his own arrows the heads of his warriors, who came like a whirlwind to scatter me, rejoicing as if to devour the poor in secret. You trampled the sea with your horses, the surging of mighty waters. I hear, and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. 
Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me, yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. This, you have here one of, the, one of the most graphic descriptions of the sovereign, majestic moving of God. Habakkuk says, you have done all these things. You are that mighty. None is mightier than you. How do you respond to that? I mean, when you, when you, see, this is, people want to debate the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty of God is not a topic to debate. He's either sovereign or he's not. And when you see this kind of sovereignty displayed and, and asserted on behalf of God, you have two choices. You can take comfort in it, or you can despise it and be destroyed by it. Listen to how he comes. He says, and we're waiting we're waiting for the day of trouble to come upon the people who invade us. Yet he knows that invasion brings calamity for them. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stall. This is, he's talking about a time of devastation. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. In other words, sure, on, on, on craggy places, on, on shifting foundations, sure-footed. He makes me tread on the high places. And then it closes very much like a psalm to the choir master with stringed instruments. This should be inspired by the Spirit of God as he gives this, this final psalm in chapter 3. It should be sung in a certain way with certain instruments. It should be played in a certain, with certain notes as he begins it. And so you have this, uh, this prophet who's bold, and I, I love his honesty with God. Folks, there's nothing wrong with complaining to God if that is not the end of it. If you're inquiring of God, Lord, I, I don't see you moving. Lord, why are you letting your people go so far astray? Why are you letting them trample your law underfoot and in the place of your holy justice, injustice flows? Idolatry is the norm. Immorality. Why is that, God? I, there's nothing wrong with that. God can handle that. In fact, I would suggest to you that it's when you get that kind of dead level honest with God, then then you are going to put yourself in a position to hear from him and to see what he's doing. If we take this notion of, well, we shouldn't, we shouldn't question God. The prophets did. The Savior did. Not impugning him, not, not, not uh, accusing him, but just perplexity. Knowing he's sovereign, knowing the circumstances, how can this be, Lord? He welcomes that. And he will also often teach you in it. Um, and so he fleshes out at the end of this what God declares in chapter 2, verse 4. Here's a man who's coming to learn to live by faith, to trust God because of who he is, not to have his trust for God tampered with based upon circumstances or providences. And so you... We've kind of walked through that. I want you to see that. Now let's look at, uh, look at the, uh, concerning the introduction and the title of the, of the book itself. Judah is about to be taken captive by the Babylonian Empire. We've seen enough from other prophets to know that they've been repeatedly called to repentance. But they seem to dig in with an increasing stubbornness when that happens. So Habakkuk doesn't even address his countrymen. He brings his concerns directly to God. How long can this continue, O oh Lord? This definition or this identity of the book as Habakkuk, the word in Hebrew, which by the way, if you could, if we could see it in the Hebrew language, it does look very much like Habakkuk. The name is derived from a verb Habak, which means to embrace or to cling. 
And when you get to the end of the book, you kind of see the name there. Uh, as he clings, he's committed to clinging to God for who he is, even though he knows that calamity, probably unspeakable calamity, is coming upon the nation. We identify the author as this one named Habakkuk. Uh, he calls himself Habakkuk the prophet. Uh, one writer that I read said, but this designation seems to be that he, he, would, he was recognized as one of the professional prophets. He's not, he's not someone who springs up with a burden. God has commissioned him. Uh, and he knows how to speak in the formal language of Psalms. There's nothing in here uh, about his genealogies. One has conjectured he may have been a priest connected with temple worship in Jerusalem. But we just don't know. There's very little about him. Uh, in the, I want to say this carefully now. There is an apocryphal book called Bell, B-E-L, Bell and the Dragon. Uh, and in that book, Daniel is rescued uh, by the prophet, by a prophet named Habakkuk. That's just apocryphal. We don't put any canonical, uh, spirit-inspired authority to that. It's just a, a historical book that tells about this. So the date, how do we date it? Well, this, this Babylonian invasion is imminent. It comes through in the language of it. Just real quickly now, Habakkuk 1.6 God says, I'm raising up to Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. Chapter 2, verse 1, Habakkuk says, I will take my stand at the watch post, station myself on the tower, look out to see what he will say to me when I, and will answer concerning my complaint. And then, of course, chapter 3, verse 16, I tremble. I hear and my body trembles. He's, he, there's something uh, epic about to happen. It happened in 586 B.C., we know that. So most uh, scholars will date him around 607. We'll give you a little more uh, reference of that here. This description puts him, uh, excuse me, dealing with the last little tickle in my throat that's just hanging on here. Most likely date for the book is in the early part of Jehoiakim's reign, 609 to 597. Jehoiakim, if you remember, when we've gone through and studied our kings, was a godless king. He led the nation down a path of destruction. You can go read that again in 2 Kings 23 and 24. The Babylonians historically began to rise in power during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. 626, 605 B.C. And in 612, remember, we looked at that recently, they destroyed the Assyrian capital of Nineveh. Looked at that in Nahum. So by the time of Jehoiakim, this godless king, Babylon had risen to be an uncontested world power. Nebuchadnezzar's successor was Nebuchadnezzar. He came to power in 605 B.C., and carried out these successful military campaigns uh, advancing into, into Palestine and Egypt. Nebuchadnezzar's first invasion, I don't know if you're familiar with this, the first invasion of Judah occurred in 605. Uh, they did not completely sack Judah then. It was not until 586 that it was completely overrun. But during that time, he deported, in 605, deported tens of thousands uh, of Jerusalem's leaders to Babylon. It's interesting, when you think about what was happening, these, uh, there was a note about the, that the nobles who were being so oppressive toward the common people, extorting the poor, they were the first ones carried away into captivity in 605. So the date of the book is, simply, is typically set at 607, just before this first wave comes. The theme of the book picks up uh, that Habakkuk was struggling. He was struggling to see with eyes of faith that what God was doing or not why he was not doing some things. 
when the people were flagrantly violating the law of God. This was greatly uh, perplexing. You want to know why was God allowing this, this growing iniquity to go unpunished? Never did he anticipate, though, that God would say, my answer to that is bringing the Babylonians or the Chaldeans to use them as my tool of punishment. And so the, the theme of this book becomes that we must, we must learn to walk by faith. Uh, Spurgeon said one time, faith swims where reason can only wade. You trust God. You trust his character. You trust his promises. There's, a, there's a, just a formula for how we, how we can, can live in life when, when difficult providences press upon us. One thing we do, and sometimes we need to do this for one another, another when one of us loses our way. We need to remind one another of the past mercies of God. Habakkuk does something of this when he goes through and cites the history. Remember God's past mercies. If, you can, if someone can help you think clearly. Remember that time when we were in this and the Lord did this. Remember his past mercies. Then we remind one another of his present promises. His promises are yes and amen. In other words, they are, they are for us now. They were for generations of the past. The promises speak to us today. Remember those. Recite them. If you're not, if you're not familiar with that, let me commend to you a book. It's, it's a little devotional book put together of Charles Spurgeon's writings, devotional writings. And you'll variously find it, checkbook on the bank of heaven or checkbook uh, on the bank of faith. And it's 365 devotions, one for each day of the year, based upon a promise of Scripture. And it's good to keep that handy. It's good to read that daily, to be reminded God has given us many and precious promises to cling to. And so you remember past mercies. You, you receive the, the present promises of Scripture as true and authoritative. And then you do something uh, where you learn to live looking to the future, believing God for future grace. In other words, because of who God is, because of his character, you will yet see. This is where Habakkuk comes, by the way. Though this happens, though this happens, though there's no animals in the stall, no grain, no figs, no olives, yet I'll trust in the Lord. And that's all he's done here, and it's a, it's a great thing to remind one another of. When, when you, if, we, if you encounter me and I'm down and I'm discouraged, remind me of God's past mercies to me. Recite to me his precious present promises. And challenge me to take lenses of the wonderful, unchanging character of God and look to the future on the basis of his character. Not my limited view of what these present, prompt, present providences may turn into in the future. And so this is the theme of it, walking by faith, learning to walk by faith. Well, it wouldn't surprise you then that the key, the key to this is faith. It's unreasonable to anyone who does not have faith in God, in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be able to view things as they unfold with meaning. Now think about that for a minute. Think about the people you know. They may be religious people. They may be church-going people. And on and on and on. But if they don't have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, lives become unraveled in the face of difficulty. Where is God? Where was God when this happened? Why isn't God moving? And it takes faith in God to walk through these. So that's the theme of this. And of course, we, we saw it when we read uh, our, our key verses. I'll just cite them again. Habakkuk 2, 4, the righteous shall live by his faith. That's the statement. That's the, that's the principle. It's the theological truth. And then the expression of it, the working out of it, is Habakkuk 3, 17 to 19. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Take joy in the God of my salvation. And so there's challenge, walk by faith. What, looks like. what does walking by faith look like? It looks like that. 
The key chapter, of course, is chapter 3, where it's a psalm. That's a, it's a psalm of praise that responds to where he's complained. God's responded. He complains again. God responds. And then Habakkuk breaks out in to God. Where do we see Jesus in, in, this, in this book? Well, we read the word, if you remember, salvation three times. Look at these verses. Chapter 3, verse 13. You went out for the salvation of your people. The, the word salvation in the Hebrew, for the, for the rescue of your people. For the salvation of your anointed. They're a little more focused on his people. Those that you have, have put your seal upon. The Old Testament language of anointing is equivalent to the New Testament language of regeneration. The Spirit comes in regeneration and makes us alive. It's, a, it's an enlivening anointing of the Lord. Oil in the Old Testament was symbolic of the Spirit. And then chapter 3 verse 18. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Notice how it's, how it's moved in these few verses. You went out for the salvation of your people. You went out for those whom you've anointed. Salvation of your anointed. And then suddenly it's my salvation. It's mine, the God of my salvation, how he makes it personal. This is what, what happens as you move through challenges and crises and, and faith is operative to where you remember that God's been merciful and you remember that he has spoken to you in many promises and you learn to then to see life going forward this way. This Hebrew word here is also the root of from which the name Jesus is derived. Matthew 1. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people. It's a direct reference to, to this uh, promise and declaration in Habakkuk. Save his people from their sins. Same language. And of course, we know that when he comes... Uh, Jesus comes in glory. What's it going to look like? Habakkuk 2.14. The earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Jesus Christ is set forth in Habakkuk as the one who saves his people and as the one who will bring the full, just as, just as they were about to face in Habakkuk's day, the unmitigated wrath of God through the Babylonians. Jesus will bring for the people of God the full, unhindered glory of God upon his people. And so we see him displayed that way in Habakkuk. What's, how does Habakkuk then contribute to the, to, to the body of Scripture? Well, I, I tell you, he gives us an example here that a lot of people are not, will not dare to venture into. He openly expresses his doubt to God. Not his doubt in God, but his doubt. God, why? It's a wonderful example for us. His concern was not because things were inconvenient for him. If you read through again, notice his concern is this is bringing reproach to your name. People are so, you read folks, oh, we're just one nation under God. We need to keep, keep that on our coins. We need to be a, a nation under God. Having it on coins and, and pledges doesn't mean a whole lot if, if there's, a, there's a wholesale, flagrant disregard for God. We ought to be the glory of God when we look around our nation. This, is, this was Habakkuk's concern. Uh, two-thirds of the book is, is Habakkuk's dialogue with God. I mean, it puts him in, in rare air. Biblically. Normally in the prophets, we think about the prophetic process being begun by God. God raises up a prophet and sends him with the burden of the Lord, the message of the Lord. Uh, Jonah and Habakkuk faced severe tests of their faith. But it's interesting how they handled them differently. Jonah, God called on Jonah. Habakkuk, Habakkuk called on God. 
Jonah ran from God. Habakkuk ran to God. Jonah prays when he's in trouble. Habakkuk prayed after the trouble. Jonah's scenario ends in foolishness. You, you close the book of Jonah and you go, wow, what's wrong with you? Habakkuk ends in faith. The declaration he will praise God. Jonah sees the salvation of God to the Gentiles. Habakkuk sees the sovereignty of God over the Gentiles. And so those are just some comparisons I came across between these two who both struggled with, with fleshing out faith in their God. Habakkuk, I, I found this, I thought this was interesting. Habakkuk moves from burden to blessing. From wandering to worship. From restlessness to rest. From a problem to God's person. From a complaint to consolation. He's a good model for us. It's okay to be troubled by your providences. But learn to move as Habakkuk moves. Come to bless the Lord. When you don't feel like it, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and forget not all his benefits. See what the psalmist is doing there? Bless his holy name, his character. And in doing that, you're constrained to then remember his mercies. Forget not all his benefits. And then the just shall live by faith is the critical verse in the whole prophecy so much so that we find it repeated in Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Quoting Habakkuk here. Galatians 3.11. Now it's evident that no one is justified before God by the law. In other words, by, by law keeping. For the righteous shall live by faith. Another quotation. Hebrews 10.38. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. That's the Hebrew writer citing uh, this Old Testament principle. As I said in the Reformation, Luther was greatly affected by this verse. Affected by it. Uh, John Wesley was too, if you read his writings. And the concluding psalm of praise, one writer said this in chapter 3 is one of the greatest psalms in the Old Testament it's a magnificent declaration of the character of God and the ways of God and it puts it on a par with the book of Psalms and so that's the prophecy of Habakkuk very different from any prophecy we've studied thus far Questions or comments that you might have about some aspect of this, maybe some reading you've done. Anybody?